The process by which a solvent passing through a semi-permeable membrane and dilutes a solution is known as osmosis. The diagram below shows a U-shaped container where sugar is added to one side and as a result the water moves to the side with the sugar. The important part to the U-shaped container which makes this possible is the semi-permeable membrane. By semi-permeable, what is meant is that only certain components can pass through. Typically, this is the solvent that can flow freely. So in this case, water can pass through, while the solute, being the sugar, cannot. Osmosis can be thought of as an entropic process, where concentrated components tend to mix. So on the left side, there is sugar, and therefore water moves through the membrane to mix with it. The water level rises on the left side as a result, because the sugar cannot move to the right side, where it would normally do so if the semi-permeable membrane did not exist. The change in height of the solvent is typically quantified as an increase in pressure on the dilute mixture side relative to the pure solvent side. It is typically denoted with the symbol pi. To derive the added pressure, we again start with the equilibrium condition, where the chemical potential of the solution at the raised pressure is equal to the chemical potential of the pure solvent, and apply Raoult's law to express the concentration dependence of the chemical potential of the solvent in the solution side of the semi-permeable membrane. So, the chemical potential of the pure solvent at some temperature and pressure is equal to the chemical potential of the solvent in the solution at the same temperature but at an increased pressure, P plus pi, with a specified solvent mole fraction. Using Raoult's law, we can re-express the right-hand side as the chemical potential of the pure solvent at temperature T and pressure P plus pi plus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of the solvent. Rearranging gives minus 1 times RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of the solvent being equal to the chemical potential of the pure solvent at temperature T and pressure P plus pi minus the chemical potential of the pure solvent at temperature T and pressure P. The right hand side is the change in chemical potential as the pressure is raised from P to P plus pi. Recall that the change in molar Gibbs free energy with respect to pressure at constant temperature is the molar volume times dP. So this difference can be expressed as the integral from P to P plus pi of the molar volume of the pure solvent times dP, which is simply the molar volume of the pure solvent times pi. This assumes that the molar volume of the pure solvent does not change significantly over the pressure difference. This means that minus RT times the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of the solvent is equal to the molar volume of the pure solvent times pi. We will now make a few assumptions to simplify this expression. We will use a Taylor expansion of the natural logarithm, which is almost exact for very small values of the argument. This means that we can approximate the natural logarithm of the mole fraction of the solvent as minus 1 times the mole fraction of the solute. We will assume that the solution remains dilute, meaning that the number of moles of the solvent will be much, much larger than the number of moles of the solute. This means that the negative of the mole fraction of the solute is approximately equal to the number of moles of the solute divided by the moles of the solvent. Substituting this into the top equation gives RT times the number of moles of the solute divided by the number of moles of the solvent and is equal to the molar volume of the pure solvent times pi. We can solve for pi, the increased pressure due to osmosis, and find that it's equal to the number of moles of the solute times RT divided by the volume of the solution. We will assume that the volume of the solvent and the volume of the solution are approximately the same. This result is called the Van't Hoff equation, and note how similar it looks to the ideal gas law. Let's now do a quick example where we're going to calculate the osmotic pressure pi at 298 Kelvin, where if we put a cell, which has a concentration of 0.5 of some solute, and we're going to immerse this cell in pure water. And we're going to assume that the cell wall is permeable to water molecules, but is not permeable to the solute molecules. And so to do this, we're going to start with the Van Hoff equation. So pi being the osmotic pressure is equal to N solute times RT divided by the volume. And in this case, what we know, or what we have here in this example, is we have a concentration of the solute being equal to 0.5 moles per liter. 
And that's precisely what this part of the expression is telling us. This n solute is the number of moles per solute per unit volume. And that's exactly what we have right here. So we're going to substitute in that 0.5 for the n solute divided by the volume. And then r and t are going to be typically the values that we normally use. So 0 0.5 times 8.3145 being the gas constant times the temperature 298. And in the end what we get is 1,239 kilopascals. Or if we convert this into atmospheres we have 12.2 atmospheres. So let's take a second and actually think about what we just calculated and what this 12.2 atmospheres of additional pressure means. So let's pretend here I've got my beaker and then I drop my cell inside of it. So inside my beaker I've got water. And inside my cell I'm going to have this solute mixture. And since there's this semi-permeable membrane then we know that the water is going to then rush into my cell and it's going to cause an additional pressure. Where outside here I have my pressure P but inside here I'm going to have P plus pi. And what that means is that if we're talking about just normal atmospheric pressure, this is just one atmosphere. But by putting this cell inside this solution or inside this water, what we've done is that we've added an extra 12 atmospheres of pressure to, to this column. You can imagine then that if we're not careful with this, there's an amazing amount of pressure that was just generated. And so this is one of those reasons why you have to be careful in biological systems when dealing with osmotic pressure, because it's very easy to generate very large pressures. So for example, you don't actually want to give hospital patients pure water in an IV, because what that does is that then generates a huge osmotic pressure inside blood cells, which can cause them to rupture. In this lecture, we saw that using equilibrium conditions of mixtures defined by the chemical potential can predict colligative properties. One example of this process is fractional distillation, where the separation of volatile liquids occurs through cycling pressure or temperature of the mixture and condensing the vapor at each cycle. A second example predicts the lowering of the freezing point or raising of the boiling point in a mixture. These two changes can be predicted using delta Tf is equal to negative Kf times the molality of the solute and delta Tb is equal to Kb times the molality of the solute. The final example in this lecture is the osmotic pressure, which is the additional pressure generated on the solution side of a semi-permeable membrane and is predicted using the Van't Hoff equation, being pi is equal to the number of moles of the solute times R times T divided by V.